I I am here. Possibly I am here. It seems to be my system is having a malfunction, of course, on one of the funnest days of the week. And sorry for the silence. Let's see if my computer decides to stay. Stay intact. Testing one, two, three. I'm going to wait for a few minutes and see how our broadcast is running before we bring our super special guests on today. I'm sorry for the bumpy start. I, I might need to do a antivirus scan on my computer because I've been downloading all sorts of fun stuff lately to do this stream with you all. So we're just going to hang tight. Normally I have some fun intro music and my welcome Green, but we're just going to hang tight for just a minute. And I'm going to just, I'm going to take a deep breath. Let's take a deep breath. Maybe, maybe, maybe we need to summon my dad in for today to help us make sure that everything stays perfect. Lee, okay, for the minute, because we have some people coming in. I see everybody showing up. The numbers are climbing. The numbers are climbing. We have a very special guest backstage in our live stream today. And I'm so excited for us. Uh, I see some jokes in the chat. It's fine. I don't have any of my fingers near any master tapes right now. <laughs> Wow, y'all, that was super chaotic. Happy Sunday. I don't know. You know, we have all this technology. And like what happened, I guess, in Katie Lied, you could have everything. And, and this is just what I've heard from you all. You could have everything lined up. You could have everything good to go. And then there's just one thing, like a radio station, to go muck the whole album up. So...
Oh my gosh. Denny, I am so sorry. Can you hear me now? Oh my gosh, Denny. I am so sorry. I don't know what's happening. My All of my systems are failing and this is so awful. But now I'm on my... Now I am on my phone. Oh God, my sister's coming with a new computer. <laughs> I need an engineer. Oh my gosh. Okay, so we are, we are live right now and I'm on my phone. Hello world, I have Denny, we're in the box. We're trying. Oh, what is going on right now? Everything is haywire. Denny's being very sweet and patient. I don't know what is going on with my computer, uh, but it, you know, it's a brand new Mac, uh, a couple years old, shouldn't be. Or is it EV Mux? Is it EV Mux? Is it EV Mux? Testing one, two, testing one, two. Oh my gosh, y'all, what, what a start, what a start. So I'm just going to bring Denny in. Oh my God, this is so <laughs> chaotic. This is so chaotic. Denny, no, I'm a computer. No. <laughs> oh my gosh. So, Denny, we are live and you are on YouTube right now. My computer is working for the second. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Denny! Oh my God, I'm so sorry. Okay, Denny, that is not the way I wanted you to br bring you in, but thank you for your patience. How are you today? <laughs> well, maybe it's all my fault. It's not your fault. I don't know what's going on, but uh, we are having a wild start to this show. Thankfully, nobody has dropped off yet. I see we still have a bunch of people in the chat. But, you know, this is what happens sometimes with a live show. I have one computer, and I am the producer. And so uh, everything just decided to, everything just decided to kind of crap out. So I wanted to uh, get my focus here for a second. I want to pull up the YouTube comments. And uh, it is working now. It's exactly how it's supposed to be. <laughs> so, Denny, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you for being a good sport while we throw you into the stream like this. Normally, I have an entrance and we play some music and, but that's not, that's not how it happened today. That's not how it happened today. So this, this is actually quite entertaining. <laughs> I don't even know how to start. Well, Where's I, Chad? Since the lights have been flashing at the house, things have been going on here. Okay, my sister just came in. Uh, just so you know, Ashley, everybody can hear you. So my sister's here today. And actually, why don't I just bring her in for a second? Okay. <laughs> Ashley, why don't I bring you in? All right. Normally, I have all these bells and whistles, but we're just, we're just going to kind of roll with it. Okay. Uh, we think my dad might be here because all of the bells and whistles are... like. Hi. <laughs> oh, all right. We got our overalls on, Denny. All right. Yeah, two Maybe I should put my headphones on. Me. So, I mean, what would you have guessed that 30 So, was the first Steely Dan album was it 50 years ago now? 50 years? Did I get that right? Oh, yeah. So, what what would you have thought 50 years ago? that Roger Nichols' daughters would be interviewing you 
in overalls, an outfit that you chose to wear once. Wait, <laughs> just once? No, did the I miss first that? Album. The did first album. Did you only album. wear them once for a big photo shoot or? What, you mean you want to talk fashion? Yeah, yeah! <laughs> I want to talk fashion. So who would have thought that in 50 years, Roger's daughters would be interviewing you wearing overalls. <laughs> I, I never thought he was going to get married. Aww. Aww. <laughs> well, he did. And you, you're you married. I mean, you guys were in your 20s when you first met, right? Yep. So you were in your 20s when you first met. And what? Ash? Oh, can we make the screen bigger to okay. see? Or no? No. Sorry. Okay. I, I'm new to all this, but uh, okay. So you're in your tw 20s. Oh my gosh. Well, so we don't have to talk fashion. We just thought it'd be fun because we we had we had admired your look. We thought it was really cool and um, hope you don't mind. <laughs> but, well, you know, uh, somebody once asked Frank Zappa if there was really any difference between the different forms of rock and roll. And he said, yes, absolutely. And the main difference is in the clothing. <laughs> so let's talk about your overalls choice. I want to know what 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 these were about. And you said, I, I, when you saw me pop on, you said I only wore those for the first album. <laughs> yeah, well, it's uh, what I wore when I wasn't in the band. You know, it, uh, it's uh, it's just what I wore. I never dressed up to play. You did wear, okay, in 1973, though, I did see you in an amazing gold poncho. Can we please talk about where you got that gold poncho? I got that at Paul Sargent's in New York. Okay. I, I had a hard that. time finding a gold poncho, so this is my <laughs> second pick, actually. The gold... <laughs> well, they only had one. Yeah. It's a oh good God. one. Do you still have it? I don't think so. Uh, but, but I, I guess I don't know if you have have you considered you made waves with fashion and not just music, so yeah. I've never considered that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we loved your fashion choices. They were actually the most memorable, believe it or not. Like I know Denny in overalls and gold ponchos. I can't tell you anything else I remember. Donald Fagan is famous for his Christmas sweater. Yeah. <laughs> that one. I mean, do you remember him wearing a Christmas sweater? Was it even Christmas? Uh, no, I don't know why he wore that. OK. These are the original hipsters. You guys, you guys, you you set all the trend, all the trends. Yeah. Original hipsters and uh, and everything else. So yeah, I remember him with the leather shirt. He, Donald had a leather shirt. <laughs> yeah, I was with him when he bought it. It was really expensive for us at the time. It was a three hundred dollar shirt. And uh, wow. he wore it like on every show on the tour. That is expensive for back then. Three hundred dollars for a shirt. I mean, I I'd have worn it. No wonder he wore it every single time. I would have worn it too for three hundred bucks. So, uh, yeah, this is the most memorable stuff. So, I mean, not only are you an amazing guitar player, your fashion choices have stuck with us. So, thank you, thank you for that. Who knew? <laughs> I heard you like, um, in one of your other interviews, I heard you like coffee. So I, I'm drinking my cold brew out of a giant uh, thing today. I just want to say cheers. Have, have you had your coffee yet? No, but I do <laughs> roast my own. Okay, Denny, before we get into the Steely Dan stuff, see, this is what I like. This is what my channel appreciates. We appreciate the human aspects of the people behind the music. So you roast your own beans. Yeah, I get green beans and I roast them. Really? So you have a roaster in your house? Not only do I have a roaster, but when we remodeled the kitchen, I uh, I configured one corner of the room with it, with its own uh, exhaust hood so that the roaster wouldn't smoke up the place. Wow. Wow, Denny. That so cool. 
I love, you know, I picked coffee beans once in Hawaii. Is there a certain place you like to get your coffee beans from? Uh, I generally get uh, four different kinds at a time, five pounds each. So I have a, a stash of 20 pounds of green beans and uh, uh, I roast about, a, a, you know, a kilo at a time, a quarter of each kind. Wait, can I buy your coffee beans? Can I, wait, can I buy Denny? Denny, okay. Wait, first of all, can we talk about your last name? I think I've been saying your last name wrong since I've been alive. Denny Diaz, right? Well, the, we've, the been, I. we've been corrected. But, we've been corrected because yeah. I always want to get lazy with it. I think it's the Southern thing. I go Denny Diaz, but it's Denny Diaz, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm not Hispanic. I'm Hungarian. Right. And in Hungary, they say Diaz, where the S is pronounced like an S-H. Oh, oh wow. So it's but, actually Denny uh, Diaz. Yeah, but my family in uh, in America, they always said Dias with a soft okay. S. Dias. Can we buy Denny Dias coffee beans? <laughs> no, it takes me a whole day to roast them. <laughs> so so you want to enjoy it yourself. This, is, this yeah. is for you and your special thing. Um, yeah, it lasts right. me a couple of weeks. All right, all right. I'll, I'll leave you alone about the coffee beans. Maybe next time I come and I'll, I come to LA, I could I could pick up a bag. <laughs> now, if you come to LA, I'll make you some coffee. Oh, good. Okay, good. Oh, good. That sounds great. I love it. Yeah, we are coffee coffee gals here. My coffee every morning. My coffee is my ritual. I got cacao from Costa Rica that I add to my coffee, and um. I do a medium roast and uh, yeah, coffee is a ritual. Coffee is a ritual. So enough about coffee. I, I, look, I love Steely Dan. I am not an expert on Steely Dan, but what I do love is history and I love learning. And I might ask you questions that you've already answered before, but I appreciate you telling me because I'm kind of learning about Steely Dan. The past couple months, I've shared some awesome stuff and and I'm actually, I'm starting to have a really a, a new appreciation for this band that my dad worked with for decades. So I kind of want to ask you about the beginning. I mean, how many times have you done that? Are you, are you okay? Can we talk about the origin stories? Uh, you got involved. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I've uh, talked about it in interviews many times. But I guess what I want to know is how was it when you first came to LA? And I, I, I would love to hear, you know, about the times when you met my dad. So let's say, so you put an ad out, you get Donald Walter, Skunk appears, Gary Katz appears, you come to. LA, you get a record deal, and I'm getting some of the facts mixed up, but when did you meet my dad? When did you guys meet my dad? Roger, uh, Roger for those. Well, we were already a band. Uh, the first time I went in the studio was the first time I met your father. Okay, that's cool. What did you think about him? You guys are both into software. How would you all hit it off? Well, uh, there, there was no software at that time. <laughs> true, Everything was true. analog. There was no digital music anywhere. That's true. Right. So we're in 73, but you guys had the same brain then for technical. Like you guys are both, I mean, you, Walter, and my dad were really into the technical aspects. Am I, am I wrong? Or what, what do you think about that? Well, what I knew about your father was that uh, he worked in a nuclear power plant. And uh, uh, I knew a little bit about atomic physics, but, uh, you know, we uh, didn't really talk much about that. So I, I'm just trying to transport myself back to that moment in time because it's a really amazing moment in... Um, rock and roll history like you guys really did live a magical era 
of recording. Um, I would guess that you guys shared uh, musical interests because you both loved um, or loved Miles Davis, right? Yeah. Dad said his favorite album ever was Kind of Blue. So, and I know you love Miles also. So you guys, I bet, talk music all the time, all the time right? Yeah, what'd you talk about? <laughs> well, th this is news to me. I never knew he was a Miles Davis fan. Oh, wow. Well, maybe he's a, maybe he became a Miles Davis fan because of you. <laughs> Did you guys I, I can't share tell records? You. Yeah. I heard this one story. So when you guys um, were in the studio, I don't know what, al I mean, album this was, but my dad told this story about, you know, you and him would stay late to try to challenge each other to get the perfect mix. Do you remember any times like that where you and dad were in the studio staying late to just challenge each other to get the perfect mix? Now, I do remember some late nights and uh, uh, and there was one night where it was uh, it was dawn when I got home and I don't remember what tune we were working on but uh, we thought it was uh, really great when we were done and next time I heard it I didn't think so anymore. <laughs> Is that how it works? Oh my gosh, yeah. Yeah, you can you can work too hard. Yeah, I think that's actually what he said about that story. Is like you went and you worked all night, and then you came home. You came back to the studio, and it was like the thing that you started with was the better thing. Yep. <laughs> so for Steely Dan, was it like? I mean, it, I, I mean, in those early days, you all weren't really spending years in the studio at this point. I mean. Julian is known for doing take after take after take. I, I mean, what do you think about, and there's gotta be a moment where you have to just know that you're done. Is there any parts in the recording part where you just said, you know what, we're done and you move on? Well, Walter used to call that the point of diminishing returns. That's good. You know, you think if you work any harder, it's gonna get worse. The point of diminishing returns. Yeah. That's a good point. Uh, yeah, that's especially, a hard point to know. Especially if you're going home when the sun's coming up, right? <laughs> that's yeah. like, so were you ever subject to my dad's race car? I heard he uh, would take some people home and scare them on the 405. Did you ever have any? Uh, I had a ride in a, in a Lotus and I had a ride in a Pantera. Yes. <laughs> And, uh, I don't know. I've heard people say that uh, he scared them to death. But I'll tell you, I felt safer as a passenger with him driving at 120 miles an hour than I did with me driving at 30 miles an hour. <laughs> okay, my dad was really good at that. And I'm so happy to talk to you because you guys spent so much time with my dad. And that's one thing that I did appreciate from him is you could be in really precarious situations, but you always kind of felt safe with him leading the charge. He had this way of making people feel okay. <laughs> like he knew what he was doing. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, he, he did have uh, uh, quite a talent with technology. Mm -hmm. I mean, so was there any point in time where, I mean, like, so you guys go in the studio and you meet my dad, you're, it's your, your first recording sessions, dad's at the helm helping you capture it on tape. Was there a moment where you went, oh my God, this guy's really good at technology? Was there something that set you off to be like, okay, he knows what he's talking about, something in the studio that he did? Well, he used to be able to uh, figure out, uh, you know, why things weren't working, you know, which happened to us a lot. Mm, and he'd be is. able to pick off a little piece of a circuit board and say, that's the problem and uh, replace it. And then it works. So do you but, think that... But my, no, my favorite thing was uh, uh, when the uh, tape recorder was giving us problems and these are 24 track tape recorders, you know, they were four feet tall and, and uh, weighed hundreds of pounds. 
and uh, something wasn't working right, he'd go put his arms around it and shake the thing. <laughs> yeah. And get it to work, you know, so. That's what we needed to do today with your computer. We should have just shook it. I know, I know, we should have just shook it. <laughs> So, so that was one of those moments where you kick it in, uh, and everything works out. Yep. Oh my gosh. Of course well, he knew where to kick it. Yeah, he knew where to kick it. So I'm just checking in with our, uh, YouTube friends here. My chat seems to have stopped, but I think we are still, we're still live. Let me see. Well, can I just say, I don't know how many times I've played the song Bodhisattva and, and do it again and just listen to your solos like over and over and over again. And I, I think that goes for all of your fans. And I just I just think it's awesome. And your your style is just incredible, Denny. So I just I just wanted to say that we're we're definitely fans and i'm i have a five-year-old and a nine-month-old um i have two girls and i definitely want um these songs to be their introduction to you know what rock and roll is and i i just think it's it's awesome um so do you listen to steely dan do you listen to to your songs you you worked on or or do you hear them in the grocery store <laughs> Well, you can't get away from it in the grocery yeah. store. Yeah. You know, but uh, when I want to check my system, I'll put on a Steely Dan record. Yeah. Yeah. Which one do you use to check your system? Uh, a lot of times it's uh, Gaucho. Oh, cool. So that's the album. So you were working with Steely Dan up until... Asia. Did I get that correct? Did you? you yeah. Did, okay. You were working up until Asia and yeah, I, uh, I think, let me check in with Chad because there were some questions about that, that, uh, it is really beautiful how you were part of the first Steely Dan band. And then, um, when that skunk and Jim Hodder, when it was disbanded, you stayed on to play guitar but it was like a different incarnation of the band can you tell us how that felt or how you how you how you how you felt about staying on throughout the years with them after they disbanded the original band uh, well i just had this uh, attitude that they could do whatever they wanted you know, because uh, I know that every decision they made was in service of the music mm -hmm. and, uh, and nothing else. And I thought the music was more important than any uh, personalities. Mm. So that's beautiful. You understood what they were trying to do. And after a few albums, you were like, just do that. Yeah, they wanted to hire, uh, you know, some uh, top notch musicians you know, and, uh, and we were just a bunch of kids. <laughs> Wait, we yeah. don't see it like that, but Wait, you're the yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, but you're the one who put the ad out. You were a top notch musician yes. too. Did yeah. it, was it your ad? What summoned them? You put an ad in the village voice or something? Uh, yeah, you know, it was fun, but I mean, there's a difference between some kids in a garage and, uh, you know, and professionals who've been uh, doing it for years and, and really know their instruments. So they, depending on the song, they were looking for different playing styles, I guess, and sounds. Yeah, I, I once uh, heard Jim Keltner talking about what it was like uh, working for Staley Dan and... Uh, he said that, uh, you know, he went to a session, they, they spent all day working on a song, and everybody said it was great, they loved it, and, uh, and he went home, and he stopped by uh, the next week to say hello, and there's a whole other bunch of guys playing the same song. Oh, God. <laughs> Ouch. That, yeah. <laughs> what do you, I mean, that would be tough. 
Um, I know Dad talked about. I don't know which piano player it was, but somebody playing, uh, or we'll have to look this up. But someone was playing one note over and over and over again, and he started crying. And he's like, "I went to Juilliard." Just like one <laughs> note over and over and over, and they broke. Uh, you know, he got broken down. Um, I went to with, Juilliard. With that, so, yeah. <laughs> I went to Juilliard. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. So I don't know who that was, and I, we're laughing at someone's obvious, yeah, pain. traumatic event about it later. But um, yeah, I hope he's laughing at it. He's yeah, I hope. I, about it. I hope you know, decades later, you can laugh about things like that. But um, anyway, yeah, I, I don't know who that was, but I, I remember the time that uh, we had Victor Feldman playing a cowbell, you know, and he's playing this, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, this really stylish and esoteric version of cowbell when I knew that what they wanted was just someone hammering on a cowbell, you know, like a hammer on an anvil. And uh, I, I went in the studio and I says, you know, they really want you to just bang on this thing on every beat. <laughs> and I apologized for it. <laughs> and he says, yeah, it's really a drag. And you knew exactly what I meant when you got the part. Wow. So you were the enacting producer in that moment. Oh my gosh. It seems like a, t a team effort for sure. Um, give everybody working as hard as they can to get, to get what, what worked. Uh, okay. I love these studio anecdotes. I could listen to my dad talk about them all day and you and you. Yeah. So I, I, I have to ask you about the gong. Okay. <laughs> this is a great story. Uh, let him tell it. Yeah, tell it. Tell us about the gong. Uh, well, we were uh, recording this Duke Ellington song called the East St. Louis Tootaloo. Uh -huh. and, uh, and they wanted a gong at the end. It, it, you know, just one bang of the gong at the very end of the song. And uh, we rented a gong, and it was about, uh, I don't know, two feet in diameter. And we couldn't get it to sound like the gong that they envisioned. Uh, we had a couple of different mallets, and none of them sounded right. And uh, so your father said, uh, let me bang it with my head. <laughs> and we went in, and... Uh, and they liked the sound of it. So that sounds perfect. But the uh, it was on a stand, and the stand was uh, had a creaking noise when it swayed back and forth. So uh, I went in and I, I held it by a rope, and you follow who was cut against it, and, uh, and that's the way we recorded it. I'm trying to imagine the scene of you. And he couldn't wear a helmet. And, and ha, did he run at it or was he on his, like on all fours and just, how did yeah, it He work? was on all fours. <laughs> and um, m most of the uh, striking force came from his neck. Explanations. And in pure Steely Dan fashion, <laughs> I'm almost afraid to ask how many takes that was. You... Uh, not many. Okay. Wow. Were you not guys many. laughing? Were you laughing? Was this a funny moment? I hope. And the and when it was going on. Uh, well, it was funny afterwards, but you know, when you're trying to do it, you, you really uh, have to concentrate. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So something about the thud of the human body on the metal. I have to remember that. You're you're getting a gong. I actually bought a gong. I got a gong. I I'm doing I'm a sound therapist now. I've studied sound therapy and using sound uh the vibrations for healing, which um is kind of interesting taking a deep dive into based on my upbringing with Steely Dan, Sonic Perfection, actually using the sounds for healing. Um, so I got a gong. I got a gong. How big? It's uh, 34 inches. How big was the gong you guys used? It's so uh, 34 inches. I think, how do they, is that the 
I'm looking at you like you know. I think it's. I think you said it was a couple feet or. Yeah. Thirty-four inches. Well, that's almost. Yeah, like that feet. sounds about right. Yeah. Is that about the size gong that? Uh... Yeah, I wonder where that went. Um, yeah. Which studio was that? Cherokee. Okay. Cherokee. Yeah. Does. Do they still have it? I wonder. Okay. Oh uh, Cherokee still exists, but it's yeah. not in that location anymore. Yeah. Okay. Do you uh, have any fun anecdotes from the Cherokee studio days? Because uh, I've heard a few, and it sounded like the Wild West literally out there. Well, it's out in Chatsworth, uh, which is uh, horse country. I mean, the, the neighboring ranch, uh, they had their uh, horse exerciser, which, you know, Look like an umbrella, and they like two or three horses uh, hooked up, and they walk them around in circles. At Cher wait, there was horses at Cherokee. No, the neighbor. Cherokee's oh. the they, they were like a little, uh, little ranch type property. It it was it was a converted barn, actually that they made into a studio. Right, right, and then you guys were also next to Spawn Ranch, which is infamous out there. Uh, yeah, but I, I don't even know where that is, and I didn't know at the time that we were near that. Okay. Yeah, I heard some stories from Bruce Robb where they, I mean, they were probably there. Probably better you didn't know. Probably, probably, there, probably but... better, yeah, yeah, probably better. But isn't, wasn't disco, a lot of disco um, was like, I heard it was the birthplace of disco that was. Studio, we'll have to get Cherokee Bruce Robb on for that. We'll have to get Bruce Robb on for that. So, I, I've also heard another story. Do you remember the mustard falling on uh, the tape? Do you remember mustard falling on the tape? I don't know anything about mustard. Uh oh, what's happening? Can you see me? What's that? Weird. My, I yeah. think, okay, not to be superstitious, but dad must be here today because every single electronic is well, going haywire i know where the, the mustard came from probably fat burger did you guys eat at fat burger a lot <laughs> yeah. uh, not really okay well, why did we maybe that that was i don't know a thing that only dad did on his own but there was one time he was it getting i don't know accepting a grammy or something and was like or his first grammy and he said i'd like to thank Fat burger. <laughs> Dad thinks I mean, fat burger. Yeah, hopefully along with other people, but um, yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, high jinks in the studio. My dad uh, drank a lot of Coca Colas and ate a lot of burgers. So I'm trying to get up. I want to get up a uh, an amazing video to play to take a few minutes here. Um, I'm almost afraid to do anything on my computer, but I would love to play um, one of the videos from the Midnight Special where you're actually not wearing your gold poncho. You're uh, you're wearing, um, you know, I would love to, tell us about that it show. It doesn't matter what he's wearing. I'm sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Denny. Denny, I worked in fashion. Can you tell? I'm really excited about your gold <laughs> poncho. This is not what he expected to talk about. Sorry. I mean, like, we could talk about your guitar playing, but everyone talks to you about that. No, seriously. No, we want to hear. We want to talk about that. I mean, tell us about the Midnight Special. What do you remember about that gig? Uh, Not a lot. It was a long time ago, and it was just oh. like an hour or two. I mean, well, it has surfaced recently. Like a few weeks ago, it surfaced, and everybody has been so excited because there's not a lot of video of you guys back then. Yeah, well, that was one where we actually played, unlike the Dick Clark show where it's all just lip syncing. Oh, okay. Oh, the Dick Clark show is lip syncing, and you guys were actually playing for the Midnight Special. Right. I see. So I see a few songs up here, you guys. Uh, there's My Old School, um, Reel It In The Years, Showbiz Kids, and then Do It Again. That's the four songs that they put online from Midnight Special. I mean, you said it was an hour long, so there must be more. 
Oh, we didn't play for an hour. It's just we were there for an hour. Oh. oh. You know, and they have a number of acts, and they, Do you, play you know, they, they yeah. give you like a, a song or two. Yeah, which song? Which song should we play for everybody? I think "Do It Again" is uh, "Do It Again" is where you have yes. See, this is where um, Donald is singing backup. So let's play, let's play "Do It Again" for everybody. We'll take a few minutes here, and uh, I'll bring Chad on next to add a few, ask a few fan questions. So let me see if my computer will let us share screen. Do it again. How long is this? How long? A few minutes. So we'll take a few minutes here, Denny, and we will play uh, this amazing video for the Midnight Special. You in your element, in the zone, playing Do It Again in 
everybody welcome <laughs> Denny that solo is amazing you're amazing I just love okay Okay, wait. I haven't seen that for 50 years. Oh, God. I mean, can we please talk about how spiritual that looked? Like, what were you feeling in that moment? You're not even looking at your guitar. It's so beautiful to watch. How are you feeling in that moment? I don't remember. Okay, good. <laughs> You're like... Girl, that was 50 years ago. That's totally a fair answer. You know, uh, well, we could see your passion and we could see your love because there's something really amazing about watching guitar players and musicians in general that look like they're having a spiritual moment playing their instrument. And I'm so grateful for that. So thank you. Well, I do like to play. Yeah, you can you can tell. So. Denny, please meet our mod, my friend, Chad, our, are you my resident Steely Dan expert? Uh, I'm a wannabe Steely Dan expert, sure. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much I still don't know. Turn it, okay, so sorry, your mic's a little hot, Chad. Can you turn it down? Let me, let me back it off just a little bit, yeah. Hang on one yeah. second. So Chad has been super awesome in helping me uh, produce the show, and he helped me gather questions because um, there were a lot of questions. So I wanted Chad to help me. So Chad, you came with audience questions. What's I came one? prepared. First of all, is my mic any better? Is this good level? Yeah, that's better. Thanks. All right, perfect. I, sure. I, my, it was my fault. We did not get to test anything before <laughs> the show because my computer decided to explode. So we're doing it live. Yes. All right. So, um, wow, there are a lot of great questions from from the audience as well as you know. Prior to this, we gathered a bunch of questions, Denny, from folks on Twitter. Um, and first of all, I'd like to apologize for not wearing my overalls. They're in the wash. Um, otherwise, I would have joined the like, the club today. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> I haven't owned a pair of overalls for 50 years. <laughs> Me either. And I'm only 51. So there you go. <laughs> um, there's There's been a lot of, of well-deserved love in, in all these questions and, and all the chats that I've been in about the solo for your gold teeth too. And one of the questions that has come up, you know, old, many times and I just want to ask one question because one, one person actually sort of encapsulated the whole thing beautifully. And, and this is the way I think it should be asked. And Michael Selvage, who goes by Selviano on Twitter, said, please ask Denny if the rumors are true that he ascended to a higher plane after conceiving the solo for your gold teeth, too. And if so, does he still live in that plane of existence? <laughs> well, uh, uh... That's a question I can't think of an answer for. <laughs> I'm trying to get to that plane of existence like every day. I do a 30 minute meditation every day and now I have my gong. I'm working on getting there, Denny. It looks like a beautiful place to be. And I think you know, maybe the follow-up question, and, and this ties into something that DP, who's with us today on, on the stream, asked earlier is, you know, when you're playing solos on a track like Asia or Your Gold Teeth 2, are you thinking scales in your head or are you just playing over the changes? You know, are you sort of playing what you feel? And I guess the, the sort of follow-on to that is, are you self-taught or, you know, did you have a teacher growing up? Uh, well, I... I had uh, several teachers, actually. Um, the one I remember the most was uh, Billy Bauer. Uh, he was a resident guitar player with the Tonight Show band at the time, uh, you know, in the early 60s and, uh, and such. He was an excellent guitar player. You know, he had a, uh, a D'Angelico who showed it to me. Uh, there's not very many of them anymore. But, you know, it, uh, he uh, really gave me an appreciation for music. You know, I, I would complain to him about the quality of, uh, of, you know, popular music and the way it's mostly trash. And uh, 
and he was a philosopher. He said, you know, these things have been going on for thousands of years. And someday some guy will come along and make it better. And then it'll get lousy again. And then it'll get better again. You know, so it, uh, not to worry. But uh, to answer your question, uh, I, I, I do try to keep the scales in, uh, and chords in mind. Uh, but mostly uh, for those songs, you have to prepare in advance because they're not your normal songs. It's not like you can walk in cold and never heard the thing and then you're going to play a solo like that. You know, you, you work with it for a week and you get real familiar with the changes so that when you're playing, you can think of the melodic content of what you're doing and, uh, and keeping the, uh, the scales and arpeggios in the back of your mind. Okay. Yeah. So um, Camps Jams, who is also with us, I believe, today on the stream, um, asked in advance, please ask Denny if he has ever once bent a guitar string in any solo. <laughs> uh Probably, but I don't think there's one on record. <laughs> there was uh, uh, one note and one song on record where I did bend the string, and that was on specific request from uh, Donald Fagan. And that is uh, the, uh, the prelude to the guitar solo on Green Earrings. It's the last note before the guitar solo, and, and the string is bent. Yeah, I love that solo, by the way. It's one of my favorite Steely Dan songs, too. One of the uh, shortest sessions that I've played, by the way. Really? Yeah, 15 minutes it was done. Wow, it wasn't a 200-take marathon like the rest of them? Nope, maybe three, four takes, that was it. Wow. Cool. Um, let's see. Next, uh, we have Skinny Post Malone, who goes by the P stall on Twitter, wants to know, was there a moment where you thought to yourself or just knew we are really uniquely good as a band? Uh, I knew the material was was something special. You know, uh, we struggled to perform it. You know, it was really like on the edge of our abilities, uh, which is uh, why they wanted to go with studio musicians later on, because uh, we just really didn't have the expertise to pull it off. Yeah, and that goes back to what you said earlier about how Donald and Walter were always thinking in service of the music, which I think is just a great way to sort of sum that up, right? And, and it makes sense. Um, okay, Jeffrey Morgan, who goes by JK Morg on Twitter, wants to know, uh, can you rank or just tell us your favorite or most proud guitar moments with Steely Dan? What stands out to you as a player? Uh, well, there's, there's a few of them, but... Uh... I think uh, Your Gold Teeth 2 was the strangest series of, of chords and, uh, and key changes that I ever had to play on. Um, and actually, I got a compliment from Victor Feldman when he heard it. He was in the studio and he says, uh, that's uh, really quite nice playing over all those changes. And uh, it was, uh, that was a real proud moment. I mean, Victor Feldman is a really accomplished musician. He's uh, played with Miles Davis, and uh, he has his own records as well. Yeah, Victor's amazing. That's just, uh, it's got to be such a compliment at a, such a young age that you were, I guess, right, when, when he told you that. Yeah, I mean, we had him playing percussion and uh, piano and, uh, and uh, vibes. Right. Um, let's see. What else do we have? Um, 
So since he asked before about mustard on a tape, I just wanted to know if maybe I filled in a few more of the, the details that would jog your memory a little bit. Um, apparently it was during the recording of the Boston rag. And I think you were trying to punch in part of a solo or part of a guitar track. And I guess the story goes, um, and this is from the liner notes of, of the reissue of uh, countdown. I think by the way, that, um, that same piece of tape just wouldn't stick. Like whatever you were recording, I guess, whenever Roger would rewind it, it just wouldn't be there, whatever you were recording. So I guess they finally gave up, changed tapes, did something to sort of, you know, get, get the track the way they wanted to finish it. And then apparently the, the tape was sent to somebody, whether it was 3M or whatever manufacturer it was, and, and they did an analysis on it and found that there was mustard on the tape and they're not sure how it got there. Does that ring a bell at all? No, I've never heard this story before. Ah, <laughs> uh, look at us bringing you fun facts. I mean, there's so much Steely Dan lore, Denny. There really is. Yeah. I couldn't even tell you who it was that liked mustard. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. All right, let's see. What else do we have? Um so one of the other things that that surfaced again recently, thanks to Simpsy, is the the Schlitz jingle that you guys did. Um, so uh, everybody wants to know if you've had a chance to revisit it. You know, have you listened to it again since it sort of came back out? And do you have any memories of, of that whole thing? Uh, well, I heard it. You know, uh, I remember uh, holding the helium tank and feeding helium to Jeff Baxter. That's what was in that tank. You were feeding. Okay. So you were holding the gong for my dad to ram his head into, and you were also feeding skunk the helium. This right. was a team effort. This was a team effort, all these shenanigans. Yeah. Now, I remember when they delivered the helium, uh, uh, everybody tried some. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and uh, hear each other's voices on helium. It, uh, it's fun. Who delivered it? Did you? I uh, saw somewhere that the ad agency, um, Donald, you guys told the ad agency rep to go get helium and a couple sombreros. And uh, you, like you sent him this, this, you gave him this list of stuff to get. Is that what happened? I don't know how that happened. You know, usually, uh, Donald would think of something, he would mention it to Walter, and then Walter would tell Gary, and uh, Gary would get it done. So all of a sudden, though, you have a helium tank and a sombrero, and then... The... <laughs> okay, I, what else, What were you all working on that day? Did you just, like, slip the ad, the, the jingle in between other sessions, or what, how did that play out? Uh, I really don't remember. Uh, it was probably the only thing we did that day was to do the commercial. Mm -hmm. And then, so my dad was taking photos because you're you're the one who ended up with the sombrero on and holding the helium tank in that famous uh, Katie Lide in the back on the back of Katie Lide. You have that. There's a famous picture: Donald in his Christmas sweater, you with your helium tank and sombrero. <laughs> like. What kind of ridiculousness is that? Oh my gosh. Do you remember that moment taking that photo? Whose idea was that? No, and I'm sure there's a lot more photos somewhere. I found yeah. them. Well, if, if you found them, you know there's a lot of photos from that day. Okay, I found I found a stash of 1970s photos because my dad so my dad had a camera a lot right do you remember that at all yeah he had quite a setup he had a uh, a camera on a on a small tripod uh and a remote control that he could uh, click it from across the room and take a picture uh that's cool yeah he was a uh, also a professional race photographer car race photographer yeah, I mean, he had the, the fancy flash and, uh, and the motor drive that would advance the film. The 
motor drive that would advance the film. I don't know if I know what that is. The motor. Well, you know, when you take a picture with an old style camera that has film in it. Right. Yeah. Then you have to uh, uh, turn the crank to move the film to the next picture. Okay. So he, that was motorized. That was motorized. Oh, wow. Yeah. Dad was on the bleeding edge of technology. Everything he had was like the best at that moment. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I actually just found, you know, I've been posting some slides and I've been posting some vintage Steely Dan photos and I actually found a bunch of negatives recently. So I'm gonna go get those, uh, I'm gonna go get those scanned, um, but yeah, I've got some great photos I think of you, Denny, so I'll have to send them of uh, you smoking, Sorry, wait, I should have, sorry, I think. Cigarettes. No, cigarettes. I'm <laughs> no. sorry, I don't know if I should have said that on live YouTube, but there's cigarettes in the photo. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know what I got. I, You guys, do, did you go, uh, do you remember being on Hollywood Boulevard doing that photo shoot with them? Uh, no, not really. Okay, because I didn't see any photos of you in the in the uh, in that, so I was wondering if you were there or not. They were shooting; they were trying to get a cover shot for "Can't Buy a Thrill," um, the first album. They went to Hollywood Boulevard in the morning, and yeah, Ashley's asking, oh. "What was the meaning behind?" No, that? let's not ask. Let's not ask. Okay. Let's not ask. I think there's some things we shouldn't ask. <laughs> There's some things we shouldn't ask, but yeah, Denny, I'm so excited. I found 1972 to 74 photos of you guys in the studio. So I'll have to share. I love that stuff. Was anybody filming? Was anybody filming? Did anybody else have a camera? What, uh, during the first album? Yeah, the first few albums. Did anybody else have a camera around or? No. No. Oh my God. Yeah, there's a look. I mean, I'm I'm starting to realize that my dad might have some of the only photos of you guys in the studio during that era because it was a very. I mean, there was occasionally sometimes when uh, like the the record company would want to get photographs, mm -hmm. you know, and they would hire a like a professional photographer. You know, like that uh, picture with the uh, with the giant eagle. We're, we're all sitting at the, at the foot of uh, this huge bird. Uh, that was taken at Ed Karif's house in uh, in Benedict Canyon. And he was a photographer. Mm. That's cool. Yeah, but yeah, the intimate photos of you guys working on stuff. Um, I'm realizing now are pretty rare and I'm so happy my dad had a camera because you're one of the only bands that didn't really have lots of crew around you taking photos and documenting. Well, nobody takes pictures of unknown bands. Oh, my dad did though. Yes. Dad was a documentarian unknown, but wait, your first album was a hit. So by the first album, it yeah, was, but before it was released, it wasn't a hit. True. But then the second and third album, I mean, you guys just didn't have lots of film crew. You didn't have film crew. You didn't have I, people in there taking pictures and stuff. Well, I remember there was some photographers at, uh, at some um, live performances. Mm -hmm. You know, they'd be walking around at the front of the stage and taking pictures. Okay, Chad, sorry. Sorry to interlude with that photo. No, no, I don't know where, where we started going on a 1970s photo. So let's stay on the 70s, Denny. And we have a couple, <laughs> couple more couple more questions, and then I'm going to hand it back over to Simsy to wrap up. But okay. um, SV O'Rourke, who's with us today as well on the stream, uh, wants to know if you remember playing any concerts with Linda Ronstadt around maybe 1973. No. No. No, you don't remember or no, you weren't there? I, I don't think we did. Uh, I, I think um, Jeff Baxter knew her from the Stone Ponies. 
So maybe it was mistaken identity. Could have been skunk. Um, and then uh, let's talk a bit about guitars. So Blues Sky, who's on the stream, asked, do you still have the telly that we see you playing in the Midnight Special and other clips? Uh, I do, but it's been modified. Actually, it was modified by Jeffrey Baxter. You know, he used to work at uh, uh, Valley Arts and, uh, and do work on guitars. And he said, let me uh, fix it up for you. He changed the pick guard, so it now has a black pick guard, which you may have seen in other photos. Uh, he uh, changed the uh, the lead pickup to a humbucker, so now it has two humbuckers instead of just one. Um, the uh, fingerboard is the same, but he did a fret job as well and changed the tuning heads uh, and replaced the bridge. Wow. So, did, and he also uh, added some. Uh, coil fader so there's a bunch of switches on it as well i still have it i haven't played it in uh, many years wow so the coil faders were like coil taps to split the humbuckers down to a single coil yeah cool i have a telly you can see behind me it's my it's my baby <laughs> so fellow telly guy all right. Um, I think the last thing um, that I'd like to ask from the questions that we've gotten, um, S. Flavius Mercurius, great, great screen name, is with us today and said, does Denny play arch tops? Um, speaking of the D'Angelico and also wants to know about your influences. <laughs> uh, well, that's two questions. Um, I do have an arch top. I have a Gibson ES5. Uh, uh, I at one time had a Barney Kessel and uh, and uh, before that I had a different arch top Gibson that uh, uh, you know before Steely Dan I thought I would be a jazz guitar player so uh, my influences were like uh, Wes Montgomery and uh, uh, what's his name Jim Hall you know, and a few others. Uh, I, I prefer listening to horn players, though. You know, they, uh, in fact, at, at one point I thought maybe I should have been a horn player, but uh, I never had the breath for it. Yeah, I think we can all hear the, the influence of the, the horn players in some of your solos, right? You've, you've got that bop um, aesthetic, if you will. So great. Well, thank you. That, that's, I think, all we had, Simsi, from the audience. I mean, we may have had a few more that I might have missed, and apologies if I missed anybody, but I think those were the big ones. Oh, good. Yeah, I'm looking right now. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not chatting. I'm actually chatting on the YouTube right now because I'm afraid to mess with my computer at all. So... Uh, I'm just checking our audience for um, Daryl. We have Daryl Broken Bra. I'm sorry if I'm mis mispronouncing your last name, but um, I see. Did the band ever film a radio tape being in the studio in the 70s? We answered that. My dad was the photographer and also, I mean, just for fun. I think he had it in the studio a couple days. Um, we have yet to find film. Maybe we have yet to find film. I'm pretty sure my dad was just taking pictures. But uh, and Daryl's also asking, do you know who are the musicians that were hired for the tour? But you guys were the musicians on the tour, so I'm not sure about that question. Like so. Well, on the first tour, it was just us. But after that, uh, we hired a few extra people with. Uh, with Donald Fagan called the uh, Steely Dan Reserve Flotilla. Steely Dan uh, Reserve Flotilla. We had uh, <laughs> uh, two girl singers and uh, and Royce Jones who uh, uh, played congas and sang. That's amazing. And Anton Jerome, wait, Jerome, the he. Okay, do you remember that he would intro? Jerome. You? Jerome, yes. Do you remember your introduction guy? He was the truck driver. <laughs> that is the, I, okay, that is one of my most favorite 
band intros of all time. Jerome introing you guys from the Santa Monica Civic Center. Yeah, well, that was Walter's idea because we used to hang out with Jerome. He was a cool guy, <laughs> you know. And, and after we had him introduce the band one time, he went out and bought himself a a, a new suit, <laughs> you know. And uh, he did the introduction on a lot of gigs. And every time he did it, it, it took him a little bit longer. <laughs> If it's not good for you, I hope it's good to you. I know I'm misquoting him, Chad, but right, isn't that? Mr. Stealing Dad or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he was, okay, so he was drunk and he was also driving the truck. That sounds uh, not at the same day, time. Honey. Okay, not at the same time. I'm sorry, did I get, that was 50 years it's ago. Getting everyone in trouble. Getting everybody. Isn't there like some like 50 years? That was 50 years ago. No, he took his work very seriously. Okay. He was cold sober when he was driving. Okay. Okay, good. Thanks for clearing that up. Okay, thanks for clearing that up. <laughs> I love that intro. Oh, God, I wish I could quote it now. Chad, do you remember if it's not good for you? I don't remember verbatim. Yeah, I think you're on the right track. It better, it's got to be good to you. Okay. Wait, were you going to play beast mode? or? or yeah, so. The... He didn't know how to say Steely Dan. He thought it was Stevie Dan. Stevie Dan or whatever. And he thought it was one guy, right? Yeah, he thought Donald's was, name was Stevie. Mr. Stevie Dan. <laughs> Oh my God, Jerome. Is Jerome still with us? I have to look him up now. He's brought us so much joy. I yeah. hope he We knows. had Michael McDonald on that tour too. Oh, do you remember meeting Michael McDonald? Do you remember meeting him? What, the first time? Yeah. And Jeff Beccaro brought him to a, a rehearsal one day. Oh, and that's how you met him. I, I heard he was just a kid. Uh, he was just a kid filling in. I, I got to get uh, Bruce Robb on the show because he talks about the Michael McDonald early days. Um, was he playing piano first or he, did he just come straight to sing vocals for you guys? Uh, well, he did both. Mm -hmm. You should yeah. probably uh, try to get McDonald on for an interview. Yeah, I heard his daughters are actually spearheading some stuff for him. Michael McDonald has a daughter. Christopher Cross has a daughter. There's apparently the, there's the daughters of Yacht Rock now <laughs> <laughs> that are spearheading all this fun stuff for their dads. And uh, yeah, okay, what do you feel about that term, Yacht Rock, Denny? I've never heard it before. Before today? Bef just now, yeah. You did not know that Steely Dan is literally the reason for a whole music movement called Yacht Rock. Yeah. Said yacht, yacht like a boat? Yeah, like a boat. Do you get it? I don't get it. Do you get it? Chad, can yeah. you please explain to us what the heck Yacht Rock is? <laughs> Denny, we're telling Denny for the first time that yeah. Steely Dan is, is Yacht Rock. <laughs> Which is blowing my mind, by the way. But, um, <laughs> I've I've been told that it's you know music that people that own yachts would listen to on their yachts, right? I don't have a yacht. <laughs> well, okay. I'll tell you, if only people on yachts listened to it, it would not be very successful. It's a compliment. Yeah. Wait, wait. Say that again. I'm sorry. I was looking at the chat. If people that were on yachts, if only people on yachts listened to it, it would not be. Very yeah, successful. true. Yeah, yeah, true. I mean, I, people in the chat saying Yacht Rock, the guy invented the term and it is a compliment. I love the term. I think it's great and it's fun and it's tongue in cheek. I know there's some Steely Dan purists who don't appreciate the term because it's it's basically created like a genre of it's better than butt rock. That's another oh my genre. God. <laughs> <laughs> That's a 
there's genre. These these no, there's genres that are retrospectively like there's people today making playlists and then of course like Spotify and everything. They just name things. I like to see my sister so talk herself like, out of butt rock right yeah, now. Yeah, you know, early two thousands. Uh, I won't name any bands, but uh <laughs> Yacht rock is what you want to be. So I'm just saying, like, it's a compliment. So what's the term before yacht rock then? Because yacht rock encapsulates uh, soft rock or basically every band associated with Steely Dan is in this term, yacht rock. Somebody called one of my recent records yacht rock. Okay, so Toto... Michael McDonald, Steely Dan, Christopher Cross. Okay, it's supposed to be... Uh, oh, I have second arrangement in the chat saying Yacht Rock was supposed to be a, a Jimmy Buffett diss and it took on a life of its own. It wasn't supposed to be a yacht owner thing, right? It, it was supposed to be an offshoot of Marina Rock, which was Jimmy Buffett's term. Oh, I mean, if you go back to the radio stations in the 70s, right, there were, you know, all these different formats that had these these fun acronyms like AOR for album oriented rock. MOR was middle of the road. Right. So I feel like Steely Dan kind of slotted somewhere in between those two. I thought AOR was adult oriented rock. Oh, could be. Yeah, I could be wrong. It could be adult oriented rock, too. Same, same, same difference, right? I mean, in terms of middle of the road. So not not hard rock, but not really soft rock. Like, I don't think Steely Dan was on, on that side of it. They were sort of right in that, that middle road. But I don't think Steely Dan's, like, easy listening, at, like, at all. So I don't know. There's some that I don't agree. You know, I would take up an argument that they don't belong uh, right now. You know, anyway. I think sometimes it's complicated listening, um, for sure. Active listening, Steely Dan. So, yeah. Well, you know, there's uh, a number of Steely Dan songs that are studied in universities. You know, they analyze the harmonies and pick it apart and, and dig deep. It, Definitely. It really is beautiful because you have this. I mean, yeah, there's so much to talk about there because you have the term Yacht Rock, which does incorporate some smooth, easy, like fun, like it's smooth listening and it's funky and it's this era. Uh, but then you have Steely Dan where, I mean, some of y'all songs are, are funky, but then you listen to your lyrics and you're like, wait a minute, what are they talking about? Like once you really start to dig in, like it does, it's like peeling an onion. You're like, oh my God, look at this oh, yeah. universe they're talking about. Like how, s yeah, what is, what do you think of their, of the lyrics, Denny, and how that's different than other bands? Well, you know, they were lit majors mm -hmm. and uh, they were widely read and uh, knew a little bit about everything. Except math. That was okay. So you actually have been developing software for the past 20, 40 years. Am I getting my decades? Yeah, about 40 years. So you've been developing software. So I, I have one question from the chat before we move on to that and then we'll wrap it up for today. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah, everyone's talking about Yacht Rock now. Stelia was the creme de la creme of Yacht Rock, sort of above it, but still, Yacht Rock could hardly exist without it. There's a mockumentary, there's a whole series. Yacht Rock is this beautiful, fun movement. I'm having fun with it. It's tongue in cheek, but also it's kind of like the six degrees of Steely Dan. Since Steely Dan worked with so many amazing musicians, all of those musicians had their own careers. So really, if you start with Steely Dan as the nucleus, and you could connect it to almost every band from that era yeah. yeah and even kevin bacon you could connect steely i mean you could, you could probably get even kevin bacon because michael mcdonald and then you got the doobie brothers and skunk yeah. and michael mcdonald and then you guys started a whole music movement denny well and every drummer think about all the drummers, all the drummers? And... yeah definitely at so least you just Got to see Bernard Purdy. Recently. Bernard Purdy. 
I mean, that he's worked on hundreds of millions of sessions. Yeah. Oh my gosh, Denny. Steely Dan is like the Marvel Universe. Really? <laughs> really? What's your favorite superhero? If you could, if you could pick any superhero to play you, who would it be? Are you serious? Yes. <laughs> oh, my favorite was always Superman. Aww. I love that. Superman. My dad went to go see Superman in New York, and that's the day he met my mom. So I appreciate that answer. I appreciate that answer. Superman's a nice guy out of all of them. I mean, yeah, his agenda was like helping Earth. <laughs> like, there's no other agenda but that. So yeah. Ah, uh, okay. So I have uh, before we got onto that yacht rock tangent. So yeah, that is a fun fact. Let's see. I had uh, somebody's question in the chat. Well, can I just ask real quick, if you were to see a movie about Steely Dan, and there's not many of them, um, we're working on a documentary about dad's life and Steely Dan will be a part of it. it uh, are there some untold aspects or, or what would you like to see in a movie that will um, talk about you? What, what would you like to see in a movie like that? What era of Steely Dan do you think would make a good documentary? Uh yeah, I, I wouldn't know where to start. <laughs> yeah, mm, true. There's so many different eras. There's like before the Steely Dan, you guys, after. There's there's so much to that. Um, I have somebody asking in the chat. Uh, let me see. I, I lost it. Um, uh, okay. I'm so sorry. I, I saw someone ask a question a few times in the chat. I'm trying to scroll back to it oh does kevin bacon have a yacht <laughs> no not that question kevin bacon i'm gonna get a yacht you know what i'm gonna buy a yacht one day and i'm gonna name it wendell that's what i'm gonna do <laughs> the wendell too uh okay so let's talk about um I guess what you've been doing since Steely Dan, why I look for the... Oh, okay, here it is. Uh, Static6000 says, I apologize for asking again, but does Mr. Denny remember the name of Demian's, Demian's first album and what songs they had? Wait. Damien never made an album. Damien never made an album. I'm sorry, I don't know. Was that... Um... No, that I was mean... a band I had before I met Donald and Walter. Okay, I'm sorry for not knowing that. I uh, I'm coming. I'm coming here with a beginner's mind. So Damien, Damien was a. Is it spelled D E M I A N or Damien? Uh, gee, I don't remember. We had a sign that we hung up behind the band. We, we used to play clubs on Long Island. So you guys never recorded an album. You just played and. Right, and we were playing cover songs, and we, we didn't even have our own material. Okay. But there are two demos that um, Jake Maluli from Expanding Dan published. I think Denny, the other two guys from the band spoke to him at some length for an interview and they unearthed, I guess, two tracks that y'all had recorded apparently as demos. Oh God, how embarrassing. No, they're, they're, they're great. <laughs> They're so good, and, and you know, assuming it's you on guitar, um, it's it sounds like you on guitar. They're they're fabulous, you know. They're I think he said it's, they're from nineteen sixty seven, and they've got sort of a power trio, jazzy or cream sensibility to them. I think. Yeah, that's when I had my Barney Castle. Simpson, you should hook Danny up with with those demos. You know, if we can get okay, Jake yeah. to, to send them Look over. At us. Yeah, well, I'm sure I have them uh, somewhere in the boxes. Like my dad kept everything. Do you keep everything? My dad kept everything. Yeah, I've got some stuff, you know, but uh, I generally just keep it to myself. I don't know who released that. There's only like uh, three or four people that had copies of that. Oh, well, it surfaced. That's kind of fun. Um, so last thing we want to talk about is what you've been doing for the past 40 years. You're a software developer. That is super yeah, what, interesting. What kind of software? What kind of software? How did you get involved with that? 
Uh, well, I've worked for stamps.com uh, for the last uh, 23 years. Uh, before that, I worked for uh, a subcontract and it uh, did work for Nantucket. We developed a thing called Clipper, which was a compiler for the DBase language. Um, wow. You know, I software think. is a lot like uh, music in, the, in, the, in terms of the thought process and, uh, uh, you know, writing music is a lot like writing software. Uh, except that once you've recorded music, you don't get to do another version. Mm, wow. Mm, interesting. So when did you get uh, interested? So is that something you went to school for before your music career took off? Yeah, I studied computers in college. And uh, uh, it, it's funny, when I left the group, I started writing music and... Uh, it's really tedious using a pencil and paper to write down the musical notation. Uh, so I heard about a guy who had a computer program where you could uh, play a song and it would convert it to graphics and you could print out lead sheets. So I bought a computer and a printer and uh, I actually got more interested in the computer and, uh, uh, and the more I worked on it, the uh, you know, the the, the less uh, I spent time uh, working on music. And uh, uh, I, I found a, a bug in the software that I was using, and uh, I, uh, I, I sent it into their, uh, uh, you know, to their uh, uh, customer service, and they passed it on to the developers, and they saw what I had done, and they offered me a job. And I've been working at it ever since. Hmm. That's I love that. Cool. Chad, you're into IT and tech and all that. So uh, I am. That's that's fascinating. I had no idea you worked on Clipper, Danny. I'm familiar. I mean, I never used it, but I've I've heard of it. Yeah, that was uh <laughs> that was quite a ride. Aw, did wow. you see that I mean I guess my next and last question is is what do you have planned next? Are you writing music again? Is there something that we can look forward to? Or, or... Uh, yeah, because uh, uh, stamps.com got uh, got bought by a private uh, equity firm, mm. and uh, you know, so it's not quite the same company that it once was. And uh, I've been uh, putting together a little studio of my own, and. Uh, it's nearly finished and I'm going to start recording some songs that I've been uh, uh, working on for years. And uh, we'll see, you know, if, uh, if they're not too embarrassing, I'll, uh, I'll see if I can release them. That's so cool. Oh, I can't wait to hear it. We can't oh wait gosh. to hear it. I doubt it will be embarrassing and we would be so honored to hear music from you. So please do it, do it. Yeah, I mean, you could strum, again. You could strum one note, and we're all gonna listen. Yeah, <laughs> Denny. I mean, you played with yeah. Walter before he died. I mean, you're still playing guitar. I've seen you up there playing with the guys. So I do still play. You know, I, I play a little piano, and I still play guitar. How was that playing with them? Gosh, five years ago, six years ago. I mean, how long had it been since you had played with them? 2017, I think you played with them, right? It was a lot of fun. You know, I wasn't even nervous. Aw, was it like a reunion or how did that feel? It was not like a reunion. Mm. You know, it, it um, uh, the rest of the band were all total strangers, mm. you know, and there was no big hang or after party or anything like that. You know, uh, the, I, I showed up for sound check. It was like a couple hours of, of sitting around and, and then uh, played the gig and back to the hotel and I flew home the next day. Mm -hmm. How did it feel being on stage playing those solos after so long? I mean, I don't know how long it had been since you've been up there with them. It was a lot of fun. Uh, I was, uh, you know, grateful for the opportunity. 
remem remember it? Is it like muscle memory or did you practice leading up to it to remember again? You know, uh, I, I remember it was on a Friday. I got a, um, a phone call. I was in a meeting, so I couldn't take the call. And uh, after the meeting, I, I looked at it, and it, uh, and it uh, there was a message from uh, Walter Becker. And uh, I tried calling him back, but apparently uh, he was playing a gig at the time. It was three hours difference. And I didn't uh, get a hold of him until it was like 11 o'clock at night, his time. It was 8 o'clock my time. And he says, yeah, we want you to come uh, play with us tomorrow night. This was Friday. He wants me to play Saturday night <laughs> at the Beacon Theater. I says, uh, I don't think I can get there in time. He says, yeah, I'll call some guys. You know, you'll uh, take a morning flight. You'll get here in time for the gig. Uh, okay. <laughs> you know, so I got up at 5 in the morning, went to the airport. Uh, you know, they, they flew me first class both ways. It was amazing. You know, it's, it's cool. quite an experience. I, I've never done anything quite like it. Wow. You know, uh, somebody picked me up at the airport. Uh, I had uh, uh, a half an hour to change in the hotel room and then off to the uh, to the gig and, uh, and then back to the hotel room. You know, and I left the following morning. What year was that? 26? What year was that? Uh, I think it was like 2016 or 2015, one of those. So cool. they didn't even give you time to think about it. So the, the answer is yes, yeah. you remembered it. Muscle memory. <laughs> it's, in, it's ingrained in, in you, these yeah. songs, you know. But the thing was, Walter expected me to just play the whole gig, you know, and these are songs <laughs> I'd never played before. Uh, not only that, they didn't even have the music lined up. So, you know, even if I could read it, uh, on the spot, you know, um, and I couldn't even find the music to the songs I, I was going to play. So uh, I, I had to uh, corral Donald and uh, tell him, I said, listen, I don't know some of these songs, you know, and he showed me the set list and we checked them all off. He says, this one, this one, this one, and, you know, starting with Bodhisattva, sure, I can play that, you know, do it again, sure, you know, Green Earrings, um, and uh, uh, he says, okay, so you'll play these songs and then leave the stage, then come back when we do these other songs and then you leave the stage. So I was back on and off the stage, uh, just uh, playing songs that uh, I felt comfortable playing. Wow. Mm. Oh my gosh. They had an amplifier for me there. I brought my guitar. Which guitar did you bring? Uh, it was actually a, a Valley Arts custom-made uh, guitar. Uh, I think uh, Steve Lukather helped me uh, get that, pick that out. You know, mm. he used to be a part owner at uh, Valley Arts, and you know, it's it's a nice guitar. It, it served me well for some years. So you didn't have to. You weren't changing guitars. For every song, like Walter had the cases of all the different <laughs> yeah. guitars. Have you seen this picture of it? Well, you've seen it. You were with him in his road cases. With uh, I, so you've seen Walter's guitar rack. Yeah. Yeah, there's more guitars in his rack than for any guitar player I've ever seen. Wow. They were excessive. My dad was the same. He had every thing, like not just one, but he had like every... Like it wasn't just one GPS, it was like four because each one did a different thing and he needed it for different. Wow. I don't know what that is. Yeah, that's excessive. So well, you I just... see, Chad, you got your multiple guitars yeah. right behind you. <laughs> <laughs> we call it gas, gear acquisition syndrome. <laughs> did you say GPS? Dad had GPSs, yeah, that was. That's global positioning systems? Yeah. Dad would. So he didn't know where he was. Uh, <laughs> one day he attached it to his bike, his bicycle. He had it. And like, I'm like, really? Are you going to get he lost? He attached it to You're his bike. Riding away from home. Like, he, 
He attached it to the carver when he was carving turkey one year. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and then one road trip, he made a point to like, because he had just gotten a new version, so he put like five of them on the dash just to, just to gloat, you know, or I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> There is an excessiveness to Steely Dan that we appreciate these days. So thank you so much, Denny. I apologize for the chaoticness of the start, but we are so grateful for you to come on and chat with us like this. It's really cool um, to get to talk to you, Denny. Yeah. Thanks for taking yes. the time. Well, I had fun. Yeah. Let's do it again. Yeah, yeah let's do, do it, it again. again. <laughs> There's a resurgence Yay. now. We love there's all these kids celebrating Steely Dan and I say kids loosely, but it's been so much fun lately and thank you. And I'm going to take us out. You know what I'm going to take us out with Denny? There's a YouTube and it's called six times Denny went beast mode. So <laughs> we're going to take the audience out with, uh, I guess six times that you went beast mode. And we'll talk to you soon, okay? Okay, I've never seen this. Okay, yeah. yes! Enjoy. Enjoy. Here we Thank go. You. Thank okay, you. Bye. Bye. Nice meeting you.
I don't know what the f-